general framing law. And there is generally, when the standards are, are developed, a room for more intense technical discussion. There is generally room for that. And my st strong wish will be that this room um, may be used more. I will continue on this a little bit more. Uh, because if, this, if standards are implemented only top down, they will not receive the same legitimacy as when they go through a good, solid discussion. So, three conditions, I found this in literature, basic literature by Beetham, uh, three conditions for full legitimacy. There needs to be conformity to the established rules. I think Gunther Herr, my colleague from Will Heal, has highlighted that also. What do we see? It was also mentioned today that in many countries there is an automatic, you take rules from allopathic medicine or what the medicine, which direction is strongest in the agency, and then it's adapted. And this is a tendency you can find in sociology, it's called isomorphism. It's, it's just the adaption of something that is stronger, but it doesn't go through a proper uh, discussion. There should be, um, the rules should be based on shared beliefs. Shared beliefs, and this requires that all parties that determine somehow the standard, they have to have the same state of knowledge. Why do I say this? This seems so logical, but this is very often not the case. We face a lot of regulators who have a very good knowledge, and a lot of them who have a, a, another knowledge. And there must be a consent of the subordinate. There must be a yes, you're right, in some shape or form. And this needs discipline, goodwill from all, because this uh, consent must, of course, be based on, on the factual situation, not like a child saying, not agreeing. It must be really a strong point. So, now, today, why I'm mentioning this? Because in the European Union, the supranational level, not the national level, the supranational level, this is the point of view that I have to endorse as industry representative, we cannot say that this supranational level has been successful. It has been partially successful and partially not. This is the reality of today. And all actors have a responsibility for the partial success and the partial failure. I, uh, and I'm very happy that today uh, the Ministry of Ayush and all the organizers have presented, have managed to create this big opportunity. Because this is all about, from my understanding, a matter of dialogue sufficient dialogue based on an independency uh, for the sector that is at stake. So what this is also, has also been mentioned by a lot, in a lot of presentations, pharmaceutical industry, of course, accepts the persistence of hierarchy. State structures have the pole positions, not the industry. The state structures have a pole position in the protection of public health. So somehow this installing a creative, solid, disciplined dialogue to get these standards properly balanced, uh, we as an industry, we say we want, we want, and sometimes we're not good enough to give this signal, but it's very much also a question of being invited, of creating the proper forums, in, in, in posing the straightforward questions to be able to get a good process here. And our experience is that consultations, only written consultations, do not really yield, because this is really experience which we also have written down in our annual report. There needs to be a proper exchange on the data. 
and you can't just comment and then receive no answer and then you read the guideline two months later and nothing from that what you said is in the guideline. That there should have been an, explanat and an explanatory process to say why we find your data bad. There should be clarity. So the re this, this consent process, we agree with this, is hardly not possible. So, wrapping up, we are in this triangle of tensions. Um, we need a dialogue. If the dialogue is found, and it's not chatting, it's a challenging issue, then we think sustainable solution can be easier found and implementation will be better. I would like to conclude with uh, one of the fathers of German culture, and I, I think, personally, I think he could be a true Indian as well, with the question, what is more invigorating than light? Dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. In a way, sort of underlining uh, also um, the vision of this forum from, from a different philosophical angle. So thank you very much. Um, so we're going to continue with um, Jay Borneman. We've, we've met him this morning in his role as president of the Homeopathic Pharmacopoeia of the United States. But he also is, uh, Dr. Ort was speaking about the fifth generation uh, of the Schwaber group of companies now in charge. But uh, I would say you're a runner-up uh, with fourth generation um, homeopathic pharmaceutical um, uh, companies. So he's really going to, today, going to really speak about his perspective as a manufacturer on the situation in the U.S. Thank you, uh, Robert. I always like following Christian. Christian reminds me of my undergraduate sociology professor. Um, so it's, it's, fun, it's, fun to, it's fun to follow him. Uh, in fact, to build off of Robert's point, um, my firm is, um, is 114 years old, Standard Homeopathic Company, although we have a subsidiary that we acquired in the 90s that's 157 years old. So there seems to be a, a, a theme of generational, generational businesses. Um, I'd like to spend, uh, I promised Robert that I would do this in 10 minutes, not 15. So um, I'd like to do a quick overview of the, uh, of the regulatory framework in the United States from a manufacturer perspective. Um, I am sure that I will leave some gaps that I'll cover tomorrow when we talk about the pharmacopoeia. So I'm not going to deep dive the pharmacopoeia in this presentation. We'll do that tomorrow. Um, the, oops, okay, that's not right. Okay, um, so quickly, an overview of the market for homeopathic medicines in the United States. Um, the, the, the current estimate is that um, consumers and patients and physicians buy about $1.2 billion worth of homeopathic medicines um, in, a, in any given year. Um, that represents about a $600 million business at factory. In other words, the pharmaceutical companies are selling about $600 million worth of homeopathic medicine out their door uh, in any given year. Um, there is not good visibility on the number of homeopathic firms in the United States. Um, there are more than 250 that are registered with the FDA, but we don't really know what those companies really do, whether it's one product or their co-marketers or what they do. Um, the Industry Association, the American Association of Homeopathic Pharmacists, which is the analogous association to, to eChamp, has um, approximately 30 members, um, and 65% of the market share in the United States is really, is really in four firms. Um, one is called Matrix Initiatives. Um, they manufacture a product called Zycam. The second is my own firm. Uh, the third is our friends at Boiron. And then the last one is Similisan, the Swiss firm that does the ophthalmic products. Um, in terms of channels of distribution, this is the wrong slide deck. Can, um, can, can I get IT to bring up today's slide deck? This is tomorrow's. Sorry, folks. There's a there's a, another slide deck. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to use my five minutes, Robert. It's called uh, manufacturer's perspective. the wrong deck. Who? That's not the right deck. It's called uh, Regulatory Framework. Um, it's the uh, Well, uh, we're going to we're going to let the show go on here. Um, in terms of channels of distribution in the United States, there are roughly 120,000 retail outlets for homeopathic medicines in the United States. They're not independent. There are, there are large chains, 10, 12, 15,000 stores each. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly broad uh, distribution um, mechanism. Um, the channels include food, drug, mass, so they would be the large stores, but also specialty and small stores, digital, like Amazon. Um, mail order, which are companies that, that might use digital, but, but they also have, uh, have, other, uh, have other ways of selling. And then, of course, the professionals, the physicians themselves who purchase the products. But um, in terms of doors, it's about 118,000. The regulatory framework for homeopathic medicine in the United States is really um, concentric nesting circles of regulation. At, at the largest level, at the broadest level, is the federal government of the United States. And it has agencies that do different kinds of regulatory tasks. The largest and most famous one is the Food and Drug Administration, um, but, but which, which controls GMPs and recognizes and, and implements the Pharmac Appeal Standard. But there are other agencies as well. The Federal Trade Commission, which is a regulatory agency that regulates claims and advertising, as well as other smaller agencies that, rep, that, that um, regulate things like the use of alcohol, um, safety, and, and the environment. Um, at the state level, you sometimes see a mimicking of the federal. Uh, in California, where my firm operates, there's actually a state food and drug administration that mimics the federal one, so it's actually a nested regulation. Uh, but there are also state health departments and other offices. And in California, we have something called Proposition 65, which you may have heard of over the years. But it's about, um, it's about um, uh, toxic substances and, and special labeling. Most importantly is the homeopathic pharmacopoeia of the United States. And I don't say that because of my affiliation with it. But it's basically it, it, uh, the, the HPCUS is, is a unique regulatory framework throughout the world because it's a NGO, it's a private organization that is recognized in the federal law of the United States. If you look at the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act from 1938, which is the principal, principal law in the United States, an article is recognized as a drug if it is in the United States Pharmacopeia or the Homeopathic Pharmacopeia of the United States, among other ways of being uh, called a drug. So, so the, the, H, the, 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 the pharmac appeal standard of, of, a, of the HPUS is recognized on, pay, on the first page of, of the law, and the pharmac appeal is actually produced by a non-governmental organization. I'll, I'll go into detail tomorrow on what HPCUS does, but it has some basic, basic um, uh, functions. One is monograph preparation, CMC work, where we do identification and, and quality control standards but also safety standards, lowest minimum potency. Um, and then we also have, we have uh, toxicology and safety data, and then pharmaceutics, how to make the, how to make the different uh, homeopathic medicines. Um, HPCUS has no enforcement capability. In fact, the, the um, uh, work of HPCUS has, has guide, guidance or guideline standard um, um, status in the United States. FDA chooses to recognize and to, uh, and to enforce what it wishes to do. Now, it does, in fact, enforce the provisions of the HPCUS, but that's, that's up to FDA, and that's FDA's decision. So from that perspective, the HPCUS is a, is a regulatory guidance document as opposed to a regulatory document. If that doesn't make any difference to you, it's okay. To the folks who do regulation, it's a big difference. Um, 
So I guess the question is, has it, has it worked? Um, and I, I can look at it, okay, we have a new deck. How about that? So there's a pie chart with the different kinds of stores that we have. That's fine, thanks. Um, and there's a pretty picture of the regulatory framework, and we're all finished with that. Uh, okay, so has it worked? So there, there are a variety of different ways we can judge that, right? Um, first off, uh, yeah, okay, first off, there's a stable supply of homeopathic drugs in the United States. There are no drug shortages. Now, this may change because FDA is moving toward a higher standard of enforcement on extemporaneously, extemporaneously prepared substances. Um, in fact, there's an argument that FDA may want full GMP dossiers done on one-off homeopathic medicines that are made on a prescription basis. <coughs> Pardon me. That, that may have an impact on the stable supply. That's not done yet. That's in conversation, so I think that there's probably some movement in that area. There are high quality products made in the United States with a very high quality standard. Remember that the pharmac appeal standard is nested inside the total regulatory standard, which is we call 21 CFR or Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations. So there's a whole FDA standard that lays on top of the HPCUS standard. So the, so the drugs made in the United States are very high quality. At the same time, they're safe. In fact, the HPCOS standard for lowest OTC potency is in many cases two orders of magnitude higher than the NOAA level, the NOAA, NOAA observed uh, effect level for toxic substances. And so um, we look at the Haas list, we look at other lists, um, um, but in, in many cases the HPCOS standard is somewhat stricter. Um, as important, the, the, US, uh, the U.S. system allows for innovation. Because the dossier system in the U.S. is not as strict as it is throughout the world, new products can come onto the market much more quickly. It's a notification process as opposed to a pre-approval process, and, as a, and, and, and consequently, products can come onto the market. Now, there, there's, a, there's a downside to that, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. <coughs> and finally, the, the, the cost of regulation to the regulator in the United States is at this point in time relatively low because there's a lot less paperwork. So there are some advantages and disadvantages to that, but let's put that in the has it worked column for the time being. Are there, is there room for improvement? Yes, there's absolutely room for improvement in the United States. At this point in time, the FDA has regulatory discretion over the way it regulates homeopathic medicines. It is not codified in law. FDA can change its mind tomorrow. Now, the regulatory framework that we've had is 30 years old, and it's up for review this year. In fact, it's part of the, it's part of the FDA's 2017 docket. So we may see where FDA decides to change its mind and pivot from one point to another. The second issue is that there is no mandatory compendiality in the United States. There is no requirement that a drug has to be in the pharmacopoeia in order to be sold in the U.S. If it's not in the pharmacopoeia, there's a presumption that's lost. The CMC, the, the, the quality control standards and the manufacturing standard presumption is left. And so the manufacturer has to negotiate directly with the agency, sort of back into the dossier procedure, as to whether or not it's an appropriate drug or not. But from my point of view, um, the compendiality, the fact that there's a monograph is quite important. I think there are still more opportunities for the industry and the agency to work together to work out particular issues. We're now in a conversation with FDA about assays around 10, 11, 12 X and higher and content uniformity at that level. And anybody who does chemistry and spectroscopy at 10 to the 12 can tell you, or 10 to the minus 12, can tell you that it has its own unique problems. We are awaiting the final idea from FDA about how our regulatory framework will change. And I think that if we have this conference next year, I'll have more information about that. And finally, I think there's a real opportunity for better clarity at the state and local regulatory level. 
I think FDA has a good uh, view of what's going on. They've got good visibility on it. When you get down to the local regulation and the state regulation, there are a lot more challenges. And uh, uh, with two minutes to spare, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Despite having some challenges during your presentation, you still managed to stay two minutes within time. That's, you made me really happy. Thank you. Um, all right. So Ashish Kumar, Managing Director of Shobe India, to discuss about Indian industry perspective. He's BTEC and MBA from a very reputed school of UK. And reportedly, he has transformed internal processes and perception of Shobe India. Ashish Kumar. Yeah, talk, uh, thank you, Dr. Manjada. And thank you to uh, the organizing committee uh, for giving me an opportunity to uh, share this dais with all the reputed people in the industry from all across the globe. Uh, I'm primarily going to talk more about the industry perspective, the market in India, and you know how India can actually uh, help the industry, global industry, uh, in, in, in whatever ways it can. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is because all this uh, full day we were talking about India being home, uh, second home to homeopathy. And I think it's also, uh, when it comes to global standards, we, we set, India is set for a gold, uh, gold label when it comes to homeopathy. If you see the Indian uh, market and the penetration, you know, how it has been increasing in the last 10 years, uh, if we start from 2006 onwards, uh, the total penetration was approximately 6%, which was approximately 40 to 50 million people were adopting to homeopathy. And 10 years down the line, uh, if you see, you know, in 2016, which is uh, from the data of Ashosham, which is a chamber, uh, commerce chamber in India, uh, it's four times than what it was in 2007. So it's approximately 160 million people who are prescribing to homeopathy. And the penetration, which was approximately 6 to 7 percent in 2006 and 7, has now increased to 13 to 14 percent in 2016. So this is, this, this is a perspective which tells you, you know, how, how uh, homeopathy is progressing in India. You know, contrary to the belief worldwide, you know, it is uh, progressing quite well with high growth rates, as uh, the Secretary said in the morning. And if I want to further give it to perspective compared to the global standards. Uh, if you see in 2010, the official figure said that the number of people who use homeopathy in India is approximately 120 million, which is now, in 2016, 160 million, which is more than the population of most of the European countries. If we talk about the most populous country in Germany, uh, you know, it's 81.7 million. It's primarily because of the fact that India has a population of more than a billion, and, and that's what drives the whole mechanics in India. Uh, but if you see currently, uh, after India, two of the big countries where homeopathy is quite popular is France and Germany. But if we see in 2016, uh, the, the number of people who prescribe to homeopathy, which is 160 million, 160 million is actually bigger than the two most populous country which uses homeopathy in the world. So if you combine the total population of France and Germany, we are still bigger homeopathy users uh, than what it is. So the, again, it's, it's basically a perspective I'm trying to put in. What, 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 what's, uh, what makes it unique? If you see the huge user base, as I said, you know, by the dearth of the population which we have, also it's also related to the fact that the cost of uh, uh, treatment is much less compared to allopathy, which has been increasing tremendously in the last few years when the privatization has come in big time in India in, in allopathy. The specific GMP manufacturing, I think this is uh, the, I, a few decades back, this was brought in into India and that has changed the face of the industry. Obviously, uh, some, uh, there are some manufacturing units which have closed down in the last few years, but those have closed down which could not uh, you know, adhere to the GMP standards. But then at the same time, if you see we are still approximately more than 400 manufacturing units in India, which is producing as per the GMP standards. 
I mean, all this leads to cost effectiveness, primarily because of the fact that the scale of manufacturing, the scale of uh, uh, people which uses this, reduces the cost and it makes it cost effective. Also, compared to the, it's all, it's a dynamic world, you know, in a static way, it can still be cost, uh, costly. But when we compare today's scenario in India to allopathy, it is much cheaper. And that is why, you know, it is spreading big time in India. You know, if you see the CAGR of uh, the homeopathic industry, except the last two, three years, it was growing in high double digit rates of more than 15%, uh, even 20%. Huge skilled force, I mean, we have been talking that India has close to 200 colleges. Uh, every year, approximately 10,000 people come out of that. Students, uh, probably even if half of them join back into the industry, we have a huge talent pool, which is growing day by day. And the government's impetus uh, and the government focus on homeopathy has been very, very strong. I think that makes India very unique when it comes to homeopathy. You know, not, not just Ayush. I'm I mean, this is the first time this government has put up a department, uh, a separate ministry of Ayush, which was never case in the past. It was more of a step brother for the allopathy, but I think this government's focus and the prime minister himself being a big user of homeopathy has propelled this industry and uh, to a greater height. Positive business environment, it's more of a generic statement. And when I say this, I think for the last two, three years, uh, India has been gaining momentum in terms of the gen uh, business environment which also helps the industry in a way. Now, what I'm trying to show you is, uh, you know, very a brief description about, you know, how in India, uh, compared to allopathy and Ayurveda, because Ayurveda is quite big in India. And in India, when, when you do business, uh, primarily one of the biggest problem you face as a multinational or when you come from outside is distribution. The logistics in India is the most difficult part uh, to supply to the, to the nooks and corners of the country. And most, most of the companies, when they come into India, and when they, when they buy companies in India, they do not buy brands, they do not buy manufacturing units, they actually buy the distribution system. Because it's very, very difficult to distribute, uh, you know, it takes sometimes seven to 10 years to develop that distribution center, uh, system. So what, through this slide, I want to show you is that Ayurveda today is distributed by more than 1.5 million stores. That's the benefit they have. If you see the allopathy industry, you know, and that's the reason I have signified it by like a sumo, it's all over the place. Allopathy industry, uh, the, the number of stores through which it is distributed is approximately 8.5, uh, uh, 850,000, which is 0.85 million, which is approximately half of the Ayurveda stores to which we sell. Uh, allopathy. The homeopathy only sells through 50,000 stores. And the reason for that is because you need separate licenses to sell uh, homeopathy and separate license to sell allopathy. Whereas in Ayurveda, you don't have any licenses. Which is, and this was one of the biggest problems the industry was taking up with the CCRH and the Ministry of Ayus. And not very far off, you know, on the 1st of Feb, the government of India actually passed a gadget which said that from, uh, from 1st of Feb this was passed and it takes approximately a few weeks to get into a law that the homeopathic uh, products can be sold through the allopathic stores. And that simply means from 50,000 stores, now the homeopathic products would be distributed from 850,000 stores. You know, obviously not all the range and all the stores will not take it, but this gives a good fillip to the distribution, which is one of the biggest, biggest concern for the industry. And I think uh, the in ministry, the CCRH, the industry pay played a very big role in making this happen. If you see, you know, replicating the Indian uh, gold standards, you know, one of the concerns which we feel in, I'm primarily talking about more about the Asian part also, uh, the uniformity of regulation is a big problem. And I think, uh, the convergence of regulations was a very nice word which was used. And I think this is a high time and, and I would not try to discuss this in too much of detail because this has been a point which has been discussed since morning. But this is a must for us to go forward in the market, whether it is, in, we, today if you see in the South Asian part of uh, Asia, 
we have more of a uni uniform regulations. But when we go to Middle East, where the market is coming up quite strongly, when we go to Southeast Asia, whether it is Indonesia, Malaysia, again, there is non-uniformity. But India is playing a role and will continue to play a major role as we go forward. The better scientific backing on actions of high dilutions, I think uh, India is one place where we have seen a lot of some of the biggest uh, institutes in India, which is the Indian Institute of Technology, which is ranked very, very high on the uh, technical side uh, across the globe. And uh, they have been doing uh, uh